Hey everybody and welcome to the round glass review for the Rokinon 14mm f2.8 EDASIFUMC. Let's go over what all of that means. Rokinon is the brand. 14mm is the focal length. f2.8 is the largest aperture that the lens can attain. ED stands for extra low dispersion glass, indicating that the sum of the elements, as we'll see later in this video, are extra low dispersion. AS stands for a spherical, indicating, again as we'll see later in this video, that some of the elements are a spherical. And there's also some hy uh, hybrid spherical elements. IF, I believe, stands for internal focusing, which is correct. This lens's exterior dimensions stay exactly the same no matter where you focus it. And UMC stands for Ultra Multi-Coating, indicating that there is multi-coating or multiple layers of gas-applied coatings on the lens elements. So that's what that full name means and how you can use that name to understand what is going on with this lens. So I said Rokinon is the brand, and that's because to the best of my knowledge, Rokinon doesn't make their own lenses. Insofar as I can tell, this was made by Samyang. There is, at minimum, an identical looking and identical specificationed lens made by Samyang. This lens has been made for a decade. The, the earliest listing I could find of it for sale was in 2010. Insofar as I know, it's still being made, although there is a replacement for this lens on the short-term horizon. So I don't know if this lens is going to be exiting production or if it has or if it will continue to be produced but at some point the second version of this lens uh, in the next couple of months as of this video's recording will be for sale. Typical uses for this lens as recommended by Rokinon include landscape, street, and astrophotography. I think they missed a huge one with this which is architecture and I would add that to the list as well as news reporting. We'll get to both of those in just a minute. For those of you who have not watched one of my lens reviews, or round glass reviews as they are cleverly called on this channel, basically I'm just going to show you a bunch of images taken with the lens in this review. And there'll be some video as well demonstrating it. I focus on real world use, not test charts, and not setting it up to be successful or setting it up to fail. I'm going to put it through its paces in the real world and we'll see how it performs because that's going to best mimic the way that you are likely to use this lens. The focal length and angle of view on this lens vary by the camera you put it on. It's a 14 millimeter focal length and on full frame, which would be something like a Sony a7S III or a Canon 5D, any of them in that range, a Pentax K1, depending on which mount you get. On full frame, the lens has a 115.7 degree field of view. I believe that the field of views on this are diagonal, but they could be horizontal. For APS-C cameras, it's 94 degrees, unless you're using a Canon APS-C with its 1.6 crop factor, then it's 90 degrees. And if you have M43, this has a 76 degree field of view. The aperture range is 2.8 to 22, although realistically, I found that using this beyond f11 was pointless. When you wide-angle lenses amplify all the dust on your sensor, it's just going to be very apparent. So when you stop down, the smaller your aperture, the more apparent it is. Functionally, I never enjoyed using this lens past f8 because it meant cleaning a ton of dust off my sen uh, images, even though I carry a sensor brush with me and use it every two lens changes. If you're going to use this lens beyond in an aperture smaller than f8, just be prepared to clone out tons and tons of spots. For filters, not applicable. There is no way to mount a filter to this lens. The closest focus for the lens is 0.28 meters, which is 11 inches. That's incredibly close for a wide angle lens like this, and it allows you to, especially at a wide aperture, to really do some close up subject isolation with the um, subject's surroundings also being in the frame. 
It is manual focus only, and that's regardless of which mount you get it in. And the systems are available for this lens are Canon EF, both as chipped and unchipped lenses, Nikon F with an AE chip, as well as an aperture interface, so it's got an AI aperture ring, Pentax in KA mount, so that it can talk with DSLRs, Sony Alpha with electronic contacts, Fuji X, Samsung NX, Sony E without a chip, and Micro Four Thirds, which would be Panasonic and others. As for the Fuji, Samsung, and, and Micro Four Thirds, I am not sure whether or not those are chipped. I looked for images of them online and did not find one. Uh, images of the mounts that indicated whether or not they were chipped. I used this lens exclusively on Sony E, both full frame and APS-C, because the only copy I have of this lens is in Sony E mount. The Sony E version of this lens appears to be just a standard DSLR lens with a chipless Sony E mount permanently affixed to the back of it, instead of having the chipped DSLR mount. And that's realistically the best and easiest way to do it. If you're making a lens for a DSLR, just slap on an extension to the back of it and now you've got a mirrorless lens. Super easy to do. The weight is 530 grams, which is 18 ounces. The Rokinon 14 millimeter has 14 elements. Curious. It's just a coincidence. Those are in 10 groups. I've been digging around and researching lens optics for this video because I wanted to make some sense of this diagram for you and I, because literally every element has some sort of special attribute. And some of them are easy to understand and some of them took a little bit more digging. Just gonna remind everybody that lens optics science is not my specialty. So let me see if I can put this into a way that explains what's going on with this lens in near as makes no difference accurate terms. Ultra multi-coating is really easy to understand. It's been around for a long time. Coatings are applied to the lens optics, the individual elements used in the lens in a vacuum chamber. And that helps to reduce or eliminate flaring and ghosting as well as some other issues in that family of problems. The coatings also improve light transmission image contrast and color trueness. Ultra multi-coating also increases the neutrality of scene colors in situations with strong light. And you'll see that in many of the shots in this video, as well as some of the video footage where the sun is in the frame. High refractive index elements are those with a refractive index significantly greater than air. There are numbers for what that means. They don't mean anything to me at all so I did not go to the trouble of reproducing them here, and I could not find the refractive index on the individual elements within this lens, so those numbers don't matter anyway. In a nutshell, high refractive index elements can be thinner than their normal refractive index counterparts with better light transmission. These elements also eliminate field curvature and deliver improved image clarity and sharpness with reduced aberrations. That this lens has three of them does a lot to explain why this lens performs so well. The aspherical and hybrid aspherical elements have similar functions to each other. With a non-aspherical lens element, a aspherical lens element that has the same arc angle across the entire surface in the front and a different but consistent one or the same but consistent one on the back, a ray trace diagram of that hypothetical single element can show that the lens has different focus points for the light passing through it based on where the, on the lens surface the light enters. The extra low dispersion elements are used to further control chromatic aberration when used in pairs with other lenses. So a lot of, so originally extra low dispersion glass, like crown glass, was used as part of an achromatic pair. And if you're familiar with vintage, really old timey, like 150 year old lenses, an achromat was cutting edge technology because it did a better job of focusing the lens and controlled aberrations. So extra low dispersion elements when used in conjunction with a non extra low dispersion element can really do a lot to control chromatic aberration. In all, this is a fascinating lens design and the image results it delivers, as you can see in this video, are impressive. Sharpness is very good. 
the corners are blurry, as you can see in many of these shots. And that's across the aperture range. But that's also to be expected with lenses in this focal length class. For build quality, it's, it's excellent especially given the price point on this lens. Now, if I had bought this lens, if this lens cost $500, I would be giving this a not great build quality, but for a $300-ish lens or low 300s, it's excellent. The front hood is very good at protecting the front element. Focus holds in place generally very well, and the lens is also solid. That said, the lens is largely made out of plastic, and you can tell that when using it, but realistically, again, in this price point, it's fantastic. The out of focus area characteristics are average. There's nothing special, but also nothing offensive. In terms of balance with your camera, it is a heavy lens. So on a heavier camera like a Pentax Nikon or Canon DSLR, it would balance and mount very nicely. There'd be no weight imbalance at all. And so if you're a DSLR shooter, this lens would pair very nicely in your selected mount. An additional characteristic I find very pleasing about this lens is that it has a warmth to the images. And I thought maybe this was just the camera I was using until I tried it on a different Sony camera. And consistently this lens on both cameras, which have different sensors, delivered nice and warm images. I compared this lens to my Irix 15 millimeter just to see if it was my imagination. And sure enough, the Irix is a significantly cooler lens with substantially different image characteristics. And when I do the video for that, we'll look at that separately. But the Rokinon has a nice color toning that skews towards amber. And this gives most scenes and images a very appealing look. It's an exceptional characteristic of this lens for landscape photography. For build quality, there are two major complaints that I have with most third-party lenses. The first is that the infinity focus is beyond infinity, and either it can't be calibrated or the owner has to calibrate it. And also, it, it drives me bonkers when there is no side barrel mounting index. It makes mounting the lens a whole lot faster, and if you're using mirrorless, it reduces the amount of time that the sensor is open to the world to have dust thrown at it. Now, this lens can have infinity focus calibrated, and I looked at how to do it, but I recommend not doing it for this lens. This lens has a lot of plastic parts, and while they're durable, plastic expands and contracts more with temperature than metal does. And I've noticed on this lens that I have that infinity focus is different in different temperatures. So indoors, in the air conditioning, if I were to calibrate my lens to infinity focus there, when the plastic expands in the sun on a hike, the lens would not be able to focus at infinity. It could stop down. For the lens's aperture, it has six blades in the blade count, so fairly meh. And the out of focus area highlights can be distracting because they're all hexagons. More blades tends to be better for giving a pleasing out-of-focus area. And even though there's nothing offensive about this lens's out-of-focus area, only having six blades does mean that specular highlights tend to stand out a little bit. A negative aspect of this lens's front heaviness is that with Sony E-mount cameras and other mirrorless, it's pretty front heavy. Even on the, the A7S II, which is a heavy mirrorless camera, it was pretty front heavy. With the A5000, which weighs almost nothing at all, the lens was unwieldy and almost unusable. So tiny cameras like the A5000 and some of the M43 cameras out there are really not going to be good with this lens at all because of the weight differential. And one last point that this and every manual focus lens needs is focusing scales. Now I understand that they're not included because infinity focus isn't calibrated and that would fundamentally make focusing scales almost useless. However, it would really be worth a few extra dollars to have the infinity focus be, if not actually calibrated, pretty darn close 
and then have focusing scales put on that even if they are not accurate to within an inch, they are at least in the right ballpark because that would make manual focusing, especially stop down a few stops, a whole lot easier. Phototypes that are easiest to achieve with this lens include what Rokinon recommends, landscapes, street, and astrophotography. I'm gonna add photojournalism and architecture. So photojournalism, you can crop with that format a whole lot more than you can with other formats. So a 14 millimeter focal length, shooting at f8, with the lens set to seven feet on your focus, gives you a good hyperfocal distance, which you could use to just snap off shots really quickly and then crop out the parts of them that you don't need. For architecture and real estate photography, this lens is really good for that. When I shoot real estate, I use a 15 millimeter IRIX, and that's good for, for houses, apartment buildings, and everything else. This 14 millimeter would be ideal. If I didn't have the IRIX, I would pick up one of these and Pentax came out and happily shoot it on my K1 for architecture work. So architecture of any type could be done reasonably well with this lens. Subjects that should definitely not be taken with this lens include primarily people portraits. Now that said, I have photographed my dog Steinbeck with this and the portraits really capture his surroundings as well as him, but you can see that he's really distorted in these images. Distortion like that can work for an animal because of the way our brains perceive them and perceive cuteness, but it doesn't so much work for a person because of the way our brains perceive people and the unnatural valley that is a distorted look looking person. The best metering modes for this lens depend a little bit on which mount you have. If you have a lens with a dumb mount, meaning no chip, no electronic contacts, you're locked into aperture priority shooting with it. That's because the aperture is not connected to the camera, so you just stop it down, the camera takes the meter reading, and you go about your business. With chipped lenses, you can use program, but because the camera will not perform open aperture metering, even with the chip, the lens has to be stopped down, again, making shutter priority useless and manual more difficult. And the same holds true about modes being useless for all of the scene modes that many of the entry-level DSLRs have. So realistically, if you're going to shoot this lens, plan on shooting it in aperture priority. It's a simple and reliable option that's going to give you the highest hit rate for consistent exposure quality. If you notice in the sample images in this video, shots where the areas in the corner of the images are closer three-dimensionally to the center of the scene or are closer relatively to the center of the scene than they are to the camera, then the blurring at the corners becomes negligible. So you can eliminate the, in big air quotes here, problem of having blurry corners by also having images with less depth or by placing the lens further from your subject. That said, this focal length's greatest benefit is that you can capture a wide scene with very near and very far subjects and really create dramatic scenes. I will tell you right now, this is how the lens works. And I say embrace it. Embrace that performance and understand that limitation or use that to your creative advantage. Also, with a lens like this, shooting at portrait orientation can really give you dramatic, exaggerated foregrounds, sort of the way that using four by five movements can do it, and just tilting the camera slightly so that the lens is pointed slightly downward at the ground can really capture a good foreground in a portrait orientation image, especially if you're standing, this is, and still capture a nice deep depth of field without throwing off the verticals in a noticeable way. This lens is really, really strong if you want to shoot it in portrait orientation and will give you very interesting results in that regard. If you're looking at this lens for video, it's mixed in terms of its video usability. It's decidedly sharp enough. The flare control is excellent, so even when the sun or another light source is in the frame or right out of the frame, there's essentially no flaring or ghosting. The focus is smooth too, the downside 
is that the aperture is not stepless, so it will click every time you adjust between stops. That, and when you pair it with the distortion inherent to this focal length, especially at the edges of the frame, panning can be really jarring. It can feel, when you pan with this lens, like you're watching an IMAX movie at a theater after a few beers. But for scene shots of landscape or time lapses of the Milky Way or stars, this lens would be a superb choice. And even with the frame edge distortion, I still think of this as my best 4K video landscape lens. The Rokinon 14mm f2.8 has limited uses, and those have been noted throughout. It has also, however, become my go-to lens for most of my hike logs. And this lens does not do everything. It doesn't even do a lot of things, but that said, what it does, it does exceptionally and for a price that's far lower than similar lenses. The lens handles well with a firm but not hard focusing ring and aperture ring. It also has a nice and smooth focus draw and a very long focus draw for accurate focusing. With live view or focus peaking, this is a very easy lens to use. The internal focusing on this lens is good and keeps the balance and size consistent, which is also helpful for video. It's pretty much a joy to use this lens on a camera of the correct size. So if you have a heavier or larger camera, this is a really fantastic budget wide angle option. The lens handles the subjects that it's intended for very well, and it imparts a warmth into the scenes that flatter the vast majority of its intended subjects. Skies may not always be super blue, but the image warmth is fantastic in landscapes and really provides a nice level of contrast. If you think about the way that yellow filters were used in black and white photography to add contrast, that warmth has a similar effect on contrast with this lens. Now, as of this video's recording date, which is late summer 2020, these lenses can be had on the new market in the low 300 range, around 330 US dollars. Used, I've seen them going for around 175 to 220. For this focal length, these are inexpensive lenses and they are a high quality gateway into ultra wide landscape work. At focal lengths like this, autofocus isn't a huge benefit. By the time you reach f5.6, and certainly by f8, almost all of space and time is in focus anyway. I shoot all my hike log videos with this lens at f8 with the focus ring set to 7 feet. That gets infinity down to around 4 or 5 inches into focus. Overall, I'm glad I bought this lens. I use it a lot. It's a specialty lens and not everyone will use it, but if you need an ultra wide budget lens, this one will be hard to beat. Also, as of this video's recording, a successor to this lens, a second version, is on the way. The changes to the new lens look promising, with a locking ring being added to lock your focus. That's a very good improvement. Weather sealing, which will help astrophotography and landscape shooters a great deal, because that will help reduce the amount of dust that can get into the sensor through the lens mount. The new lens will also have a switch on it that allows the aperture to, to become stepless. So videographers will benefit from that change because you will be able to set the, can the lens to switch between stepless and not stepless or stepped, meaning that that lens will be a good hybrid video and still lens. And if you're shooting both on the same day, it will be a really good part of your kit. The replacement lens will be about 80% more money than this lens. I believe it's going to be running in the low 500s. So around $200 more than this lens can be had new on the market right now.